The U.S. went just crazy at everybody. I think they said to Israel, get out of Rafah or else. They said to Qatar, get those hostages back or else, and tell Iran to stand down or else. Biden's calculations, I don't think his political strategy, if he has one, is going well. And Hamas, I feel like, is emboldened to keep rejecting these deals I because we let us make Nobody lets us make a mistake. And on top of that, this is the excuse to call for stopping the war. When the president of the United States comes out and says Israel cannot kill another 30,000 Palestinians, does he want us not to kill the terrorists? I mean, what is that? That is a bloodline. Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of The Quad. We're back here in Jerusalem. With me, my friends and colleagues, Emily Schrader, human rights activist and journalist, Vivian Berkovich, former ambassador of Canada to Israel and the founder and host of her own podcast, State of Tel Aviv, and Ashira Solomon, political moderator and commentator. And ladies, what a week. <laughs> I mean, every week, every brings, week. Every bring, brings its own... I don't know, box of surprises. But for me, the last week has been particularly difficult, mainly because we made an honest, a tragic, an honest mistake that happens in a war, terrible collateral damage of a war, which is that Israelis, uh, Israeli army bombed uh, a convoy of aid workers, a wonderful organization called the World Central Kitchen, who I have to say, not only here... Uh, you know, in Gaza. They've been in Israel since the 7th of October helping Israel and the Palestinians. So they're not one of these uh, human rights human rights or, or, or food organizations that hate us, like the Red Cross, who do nothing for us, like the Red Cross, and they focus completely on the Palestinians. They're actually helping everyone. And this happens as a tragic mistake. And of course, the world com forgets a few things. First of all, that we're in a very difficult military terrain. B, that these things happen and have happened. Happened to the United States, happened to the British, happened in every single war, never mind a war in an urban terrain. And nobody, and, and, and the worst thing is that nobody lets us make a mistake. And on top of that, this is the excuse to call for stopping the war, even though when the United States uh, army hit an Iraqi Afghani wedding. Mm -hmm. Nobody called for the stop of the campaign against ISIS. And many, many examples. I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four, th three vehicles were hit by drones. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. So, Vivian, let's start with you. What do you make of all this? I, uh, it's, a, it's a mess. And I agree with you. Last week was particularly brutal. But I think that the World Central Kitchen was that straw that broke the camel's back. I think that it was this build-up of momentum. We had the strike the Israeli strike airstrike on the what we believe to be the Iranian consulate uh, in Damascus, which happens to be right next to the Canadian embassy. And a very, very top IRGC general was killed along with others, very senior military officials. That was on um, on Monday. Yeah. And then early morning hours of Tuesday, the World Central Kitchen disaster, and it was a disaster, occurred. And then on Thursday, we have reports that were leaked um, about a very stormy meeting between, um, amb uh, not ambassador, sorry, Minister Ron Dermer, who's Minister of Strategic Affairs in Israel, uh, Tzachar Hanegbi, the National Security Advisor, and their peers in uh, Washington. And apparently it was a very, very combative two-hour meeting when they were talking about Rafah and Israel presented its plan to invade. And America said, this is crap. Uh, you don't have a plan. Even if you implement this, it's going to take you nine months to move the civilian population out of the way. And I just think that there was this whole buildup that just exploded. I have my own theories about what went on in, in the following day or two. But what we did see on the ground here was an immediate Israeli uh, partial withdrawal from Gaza on yeah. Sunday morning. That wasn't even announced till Sunday afternoon. Um, Iran's gone quiet. 
And all of a sudden, there's lots of busy work um, around the negotiations in, in, for in Cairo hostages. for the hostages. So I think the U.S. went just crazy at everybody. I think they said to Israel, get out of Rafa or else. They said to Qatar, get those hostages back or else. And they communicated to, and that included their message to Qatar and tell Iran, stand down or else. Wow. Do you yeah, agree with that? That's why I don't agree at all. Really? So, well, oh. What's your take? At all. I disagree with the part about <laughs> Iran going quiet and the Biden administration, oh. or really anyone, doing that's anything wrong. to the regime. Because I yesterday, do. the Ayatollah said that the response to Israel's strike on the consulate in Syria will be directly done in Israel. He didn't even, he didn't say it's going to be done in an embassy. He didn't say anything. He like approved formally in a formal press release that they will respond in Israeli territory. Now, if they're actually successful in that, we'll see. I mean, they didn't even respond to Soleimani. So they, they talk a lot of talk, um, but, the, but for I sure, think, for I sure, sure they're guys trying said to. It, no, I, I, I thought he'd gone a little quiet. No, no, I, no. Think, okay. I think Emily is right about Iran, but I think you're right about Qatar. I think the U.S. said yeah, uh, I, enough yeah. is enough. Us. No, no, I... I <laughs> This is my role in life. Love it. Diplomatic. Ashira, Ashira. Peace treaty. Ashira, Ashira, what's this your thing? how you get it done. Honey, balance the table out here. We need you to do the negotiation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I, I share your guys' senti sentiments about the aid workers. I think it's um, a, a tragedy. To me, it shows how much right now we need to move forward and find a solution. People are dying. We need a we need to secure uh, for Israel. We need to secure for Gazans. We need to move forward. In terms of Biden, I'm keeping in mind that he's in a, there's an election season happening right now. Oh, you think? <laughs> but Biden's calculations, I don't think his political strategy, if he has one, is going well because one, he's isolating a big demographic of his voters, which are American Jews. And then secondly, by doing what he's doing, he's also not he he's working against i think ceasefire and us having peace because you're not supporting israel and we look weak we have an internal strife now we have an external strife with our biggest ally and hamas i feel like is emboldened to keep rejecting these deals I because we look weak 100 percent, he's putting them up a tree by giving them any type of legitimacy of 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 this war i agree and, and i don't think anybody's happy with him <laughs> I think that he's basically making everybody angry. Yeah. That's what I think. He is. But he's there's also right. there's no reason for Hamas to take any deal. None. Yeah. yeah. Not not you know, not because of Biden. Just so how still, would they? How yeah. would they, they take a deal if we went into Rafa? Forty hostages. Yeah. Did you they, see this? They couldn't. They couldn't provide a list Why? of forty they hostages fit that fit the cat humanitarian cat category, doesn't like doesn't uh, women and whatever. Doesn't and everybody? they should? They should, but no. I, they, they're excluding the soldiers, obviously. But now they're claiming that they can't produce a list of forty. Hmm. I wonder why. And, you know, if they did, like, God forbid, if they did kill the hostages who are left, they're never going to admit it. No. They're not, why would because they Because that's their only defense strategy. Exactly. Because the second they say that, Israel will go in and clean up Rafa. End of story. Yeah. Do you think? So I got some intelligence or insight yesterday from a very high up uh, person with a lot of security, uh, national oh, security here experience, <laughs> that they thought that there was about 80 something alive. I hope. I hope. I, I hope know that Vivian doesn't agree with me, but I'm I'm hoping. I'm praying. Yeah. And I agree with you. What's the incentive of Hamas to agree with the deal unless Qatar is now putting the screws and they're going to find themselves homeless? The yeah. Bi the billionaires I'm talking about. Could that be a leverage? There are a lot of levers that Qatar has. Um, money being one, um, the comfortable lifestyle and hospitality that they show to senior Hamas. Um, you know, leaders, so to speak, both in Qatar and elsewhere in the world. Um, Qatar has had its hands on the levers all along. They have not used them. They could have turned off the tap financially. Yeah. They could have thrown them out yeah. and exiled them, just as happened to Yasser Arafat. They've done nothing. From, they've done nothing. nothing. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been this really aggressive charm offensive put on by the Qataris. I the Yeah. 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 The hostage thing was starting to kind of look really bad on them. And yes. there was talk about having Egypt yes. replace Qatar as the lead in the mediation. Yes. yes. And then all of a sudden, Pitom, as we say in Hebrew, um, the Qataris are getting all this incredibly good press yeah. about how invaluable they are to the region. In fact, they're what holds the region together and keeps it stable. Wow. <laughs> wow. They want to be the arsonist. I'm exaggerating. They want, no, no. You're, you're exactly correct. They want to be the arsonist and the firefighters. 
all in one. That's Qatar. Well, you know what's crazy is as UAE and Bahrain and other, even Saudi Arabia have sort of shifted away from like extremism Ooh. because they don't want it in their countries, Qatar has done the opposite. So now Qatar is at the forefront of like funding and promoting this Islamist ideology on the Sunni side, directly in contrast to what Iran is doing with the Shia side. And both of them are pouring money into Western nations. So you have like extremism from Iran and extremism from, from Qatar. And that's why you end up with, with Muslim communities in some of these European countries in Canada and the United States that are more extreme than Muslims in the Middle East. Like it's craziness. Honestly, is the West for sale? Yes. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is everybody so cheap yeah. that they will just sell universities, will sell whatever, the media will be, will be sold to whoever? It's, is it all about the money? And if it is, let's just pack up and go home. Oh, really? No value? I think this? people have sort of strayed away from constructive dialogue and from critical thinking from the universities and beyond. And it's not something that's rewarded anymore. The only thing that's rewarded is radicalism, is extremism, sensationalism from the media to social media. And that is a byproduct of like the rise of social media that people don't appreciate critical thinking. And if you don't appreciate critical thinking, your society will crumble, no matter what the society is, no matter what its ideology is. Emily, I have a question. Do you think that what we see in the media and on social media is actually a real reflection of what's happening in the Western society? No, it's a predictor. It's a predictor. What we see on social media is obviously more extreme than on the streets, but right. it's what we'll see in five, 10 years. And it's so dumbed down sometimes. Yeah. How many messages have you all gotten you have a big nose. Like, what's the deal? <laughs> no, I've been getting the message. Never. Messages. I don't sure, think you're not, I have you're a big not nose. Polish. And I'm like, I know, I'm black. <laughs> you're <laughs> not Polish. They're like, you're not Polish. Well, How what? are you a Zionist? You're a white colonizer. Oh, yeah. no, sure. <laughs> so on that note, we move on to our wonderful guest this week, Ambassador Michael Oren. Welcome to the Quad, Ambassador Michael Oren. Such a pleasure to have you. And we've been talking on our show a lot about what happened in the last week, the terrible tragedy with the humanitarian aid workers, the pressure from the Americans, the apparent withdrawal from Gaza. And as somebody who's really been in the thick of the action there in Washington, what do you make of this pressure? Is there pressure? Is it blown out of proportion? Or is Israel under an unprecedented, are we in new territory here? First of all, great to be with you both, with Fleur, Vivian, thank you as always. Um, it's real. I just returned from Washington several days ago. Um, the things that they see from there are not what we see from here. And here it's important to note that the, the news that Israelis watch uh, every night is very different than the news that Americans watch. Our news is usually about uh, the a bereaved family. Uh, it's about a soldier we've lost. It's about heroism. Um, it's about uh, restoring one's the faith in the country. The news there is twenty four seven Palestinian suffering, and the the coordinator of policy in the territories we call Kogat in this country will tell you that there's there's no humanitarian disaster in Gaza. There's no shortage of aid in Gaza. There's a problem with distribution, but not that's necessarily Israel's issue. In Washington, and this is like coming directly from Washington, they, they believe that Gaza is on the verge of a major famine in the month of May that would be declared by the UN unless steps are not taken immediately, and that Israel will bear responsibility for this. Um, it will be a man-made uh, human disaster, one of the few of the 21st century. Uh, and that was about as un unequivocal <laughs> a rendition as I can give you of what I heard in Washington. Um, very disturbing, completely different than our reality. Um, and yes. And yet, uh, it's difficult not to get deeply, deeply frustrated and disappointed. You know, right now, uh, several hours ago, I read a report uh, in the Israeli press that the State Department is examining various Israeli operations in Gaza to see whether Israel committed war crimes. So we now have our, our principal ally in the world uh, dedicating time of its State Department, which could be dealing with many, many other crises in the world, looking to see whether the Israeli army uh, committed war crimes. This is the same government that many, many times over uh, in its involvement in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria killed far, far many uh, civilians, by the way, and aid workers proportionally, proportionally, not just in absolute numbers, but proportionally. And, uh, and that never, never had that, never investigated itself for war crimes, of course. So there's a, there's a certainly the question of, you know, that Israel is held into a completely different uh, moral plane than, than the United States is or any other country. 
but it 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 makes me want to step back and say the following. Um, my dear friends in America, you have a country here in which three hundred and sixty thousand young Israelis, men and women, reported for reserve duty. That would be 360,000 Israelis, the equivalent uh, per capita of about 20 million Americans. That, that's more Americans than fought in all World War II. They left their families, they left their jobs to go off and fight for the country, knowing that they may not come home, willing to die for their country. You could probably count in the West on less than one hand the citizens of any country that are willing to go out and fight for die for their country. I don't know many people in Belgium are willing to go out and fight for Belgium. I don't know many people are willing to go out in Italy and even in Spain to go out and fight and die for their country today. But in Israel, everybody is. And what are they fighting for? These people, these wonderful young people who left their families, left their, their jobs, left their lives for four, five, six months standing, went out to fight not just for their families, not just for, for Israel, for our security. I think they went out to fight for a civilization against a great evil. And to not recognize that has to be one of the great moral and strategic pitfalls of our time. Can I say that more emphatically? Forget the fact that, that every country in the world that is allied with the United States will now ask, what does it mean to have the United States as an ally? Forget the fact that the Russians and the Chinese are taking very detailed notes. But purely on a moral historical plan, what does it mean not to stand up for your own civilization? What does it mean to try to um, demonize, vilify an entire society, the, probably the last society in the West, that suing to this degree is willing to stand up and fight for itself and fight for the values that, that are common to us that we all, uh, that we all in theory cherish? What does that mean? What's the message? And I think that future generations will look back at this moment and shake their heads. How do you get to a point where you have such extreme dissonance, disjunctiveness between the United States and Israel, where there's supposed to be this strong relationship? This administration has been trying to do two things at the same time. One time upholding the U.S.-Israel strategic alliance by providing us with ammunition, with uh, casting vetoes for permanent unconditional ceasefires in the U.N. I mean, the last U.N. resolution uh, qualified that support to a large extent, but still, uh, and defending Israel's right to defend itself. That administration comes out and reiterates, uh, nightly in the face of, of, of immense opposition within the party and without, uh, and a political cost. Um, on the other hand, the State Department investigating us for war crimes, uh, the the vice president uh, coming out and saying that she distinguishes, that the administration distinguishes between the people of Israel and the government of Israel, Senator Schumer coming out and calling for elections in Israel, which is completely and utterly inappropriate, unacceptable from a, a Democratic ally. You have uh, the deputy national security advisor going to Dearborn, Michigan, and telling the, the community there that apologizing for America's support for Israel. Uh, saying that the, the Biden administration has no faith in the Israeli government. And then you wonder why Hamas is digging its heels in and not giving up hostages. And, okay, how do we understand this? I mean, the obvious answer is the, the presidential elections. And here it's important to point out that these elections are fundamentally different than probably just any other presidential elections in U.S. history, because on both sides, the Democratic and Republican side, they view these elections as existential. If the other side wins, it's the end of America. I hear this again and again and again. And so the roots of the current situation, on one hand, the immediate roots are the presidential elections and what at stake in those presidential elections. And uh, more deeply is the sea change that has occurred within American culture over the course of the last uh, five, six decades. Now, Israel, I can't say, doesn't play a role in this. We can't say that we're completely absolved of responsibility. I think we could have navigated the situation much better. Listen, I, cards on the table. The first week of the war, I came out with an article in the Israeli press saying that we should flood Gaza with humanitarian aid. Flood it. So, because the most important thing for me for me was to give time and space for the IDF to operate and anything that constricted that space I was against. I also think that the President Biden has gone out on a limb for us with all the criticism that he has. He's paid a political price and that we could have met him uh, at least partially, on some of these issues. we could. It doesn't cost us anything, Fleur Vivian, to speak, to talk. And uh, we could have talked about a pathway to a Palestinian state. What's a pathway? That doesn't mean anything. 
We could have talked about the morning after uh, to a greater degree. We could have gone although a, a little further. Uh, Ambassador Oren, this segues, uh, your point segues very well into my next question. And that is about public diplomacy, Asbara. What we're seeing today is that Asbara is actually now, the bad Asbara that we manage is affecting our ability to actually run and manage a war. So where do you see that element into the big mess that this has become? It's, it's a deeply held Zionist belief that it's not important what the non-Jews think, it's important what the Jews do. They're going to hate us anyway. And by the way, there's lots of truth in this. I've, I've come to realize that behind many of the, the very negative headlines about us, uh, you can see classic anti-Semitic tropes, uh, particularly the blood libel. I mean, when, when the president of the United States comes out and says Israel cannot kill another 30,000 Palestinians, which is the, which the statistic itself is probably grossly inflated, it doesn't matter. Of the 30,000, you know, half of them are terrorists. <laughs> All right, does he, does he want us not to kill the terrorists? I mean, what is that? That is a blood libel. And, um, you know, the, the, ma the massacre of the innocents, when Hamas says it's 78% of, the, of, the, of those killed, which is by statistically impossible, are children and women. That's the massacre of the innocents. That's classic anti-Semitic things. I got to give credit to AOC in New York. In Christmas time, her Christmas uh, Instagrams uh, compared Israel's treatment to the Palestinians to the massacre of the innocents in the New Testament. Like, great. Uh, it just came out and said it. Um, and so all of that is true. But what we have never internalized is that public diplomacy, Hasbara is probably a bad word, right? It means explaining ourselves. But public diplomacy gives time and space to the idea. And whenever we had a, a crisis like this in Washington, I would gather my staff together and say, we have one job and one Joan Omi, and that's to give time and space for the idea. But public diplomacy has another, not just a, a, a sort of a tactical, even strategic ramifications. It, it also has a Zionist and Jewish uh, aspect to it. And I, again, I've just come back from meetings with the American Jewish community at the senior level, uh, traveled to about maybe 40 communities across the United States. And what I encountered in every instance was a feeling that these communities have been abandoned by the state of Israel, abandoned in terms yeah. of information. We left them yeah. without quote unquote, the, the ammunition they need to defend us, much less, less, less themselves. We've sent them out to battle without bullets. With no ammunition, absolutely. So in your, given, given the breadth of your context knowledge and the fact that you've just come back from the States, um, we had a very dramatic week last week. And then Sunday morning, um, we learn that Israel is engaged in a partial withdrawal from Gaza. Um, but reserving the right, whatever that means, to go back in and do a Rafa operation. What's going on, Michael? There's scuttlebutt. There's rumors that uh, there's some grand bargain out there where in return for not going into Rafa uh, and the release of hostages, um, that Israel would get a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, and uh, lots of rumors flying around like that. I also feel that within Israel itself, and this is going to get as a little granular as they say in Washington, a little detailed. With Israel itself, I don't know if that deal would be very acceptable. I don't know how many, how deeply Israelis really care about peace with Saudi Arabia. I think it's going you know, to be wonderful what happened, but you know, not destroying Hamas, Saudi peace with Saudi Arabia. You know, I think the army is going to have a say in this. And this is what I mean by being granular. In the in the year before the war, we witnessed certainly for the first time since the late 1940s an open politicization of the army. Now we've had an entire generation of Israelis who have fought for months. And I, you know, I'm an old soldier. I've been in wars. I experienced almost nothing of what these young people experienced. 24 seven combat, day after day, week after week, month after month, okay? Nothing, nothing in our experience we've had this since, since, since the War of Independence. And they are going to come out of Gaza. First of all, they're going to be an extraordinary generation. It's going to be our greatest generation. Just watch. Part of my great optimism about this country. Patriotic, strong, fragile with a big red line through it. Really. And they're going to come out and say, no, what did we fight for? What did we lose our friends for? What are these people, sustain? what did thousands of our friends sustain horrible wounds for? So we can cut a deal with Saudi Arabia? I think it's going to be very hard to, I think now, you know, as they say, the genie's out of the bottle and uh, the, the, the army 
is going to have a say in it. I don't mean, in contrast to what happened before the war, where it was the pilots and the elite unit, this is going to be the folks from Golani, from, from Kiryat, uh, Kiryat Shimona, and from uh, Kiryat God. Watch. And uh, they're going to come out and have something to say. I hope so. Ambassador Oren, as a final thought, now that we know that you're a prophet um, for <laughs> predicting yes. that we were going to be a war, how do you predict we're going to get through the next few months? Uh, give us a little bit of hope. No, I'll give you, I, I actually very hopeful. Part of that hope starts with standing up to the United States on the issue of Rafah. Here, I'm an historian. If you're going to be a prophet, you got to be a historian too. So the historian tells us that every time America told us not to go to war, and we went to war. America respected us for it. That was true in 48, was true in 56, true in 67, and true in, in 1981, we blew up the Iraqi nuclear reactor. Every time America told us not to go to war and we succumbed, we got contempt. 1973, and the first Gulf War, standing strong will not only get us respect in the United States, it'll get us more peace treaties with Arab countries. Okay, we have to give war a chance here. They, they want to make peace with us, not because they love us. They want to make peace with us because we're, we're going to defend them. But we also have to be smart. We can't just be strong. We got to be smart. Be smart. Give President Biden the, you know, the political tailwind that he maybe needs on the Palestinian issue, on humanitarian aid. Be smart. Create time and space for the IDF. You know, as both of you have been involved in diplomacy, that with every great crisis, there's an e at least an, an, an equal or at least greater opportunity. We have an opportunity with this war to clean out our political house. We have an opportunity to address some of the fundamental challenges facing this country that can prove existential. And we have that chance to rebuild. And by the way, we're going to have the generation that can do it. And if you ask me if I'm up to optimistic about the future of this country, I'm very optimistic about the future of this country. We have been given, with all the agony, we've been given an opportunity. That's the best way to end. We could listen to you all day, at least another hour. Uh, but unfortunately, this that. is all. Yes. Ambassador Orton, thank you for being that light for so many people. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. Call to. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So now for our very favorite and popular segment, Scumbag of the Week. Okay, ladies, another week full of incredible scumbags. And Emily, you actually got a chance to face your scumbag in a debate on Piers Morgan. Tell us who your scumbag is. So my scumbag this week is Abby Martin, who is a vile conspiracy theorist, anti-Semite, supporter of pretty much every dictatorship on earth. And uh, I don't even know why Piers Morgan had her on. I mean, he's had quite a few she does. characters uh, Has a lot of like it's that, but, but still she was uh, extreme. I mean, I think we have a clip of it. I'm not justifying as a terrorist anything that they've done. Um, the United States also called Nelson Mandela and the ANC a terrorist organization. Do you I think they're think an armed resistance group trying to fight for the liberation of Palestine. Do you think they're I'm a terrorist organization? I'm not going to sit here and give an obligatory... Do you think Israel's a terrorist organization, of course Emily? Not. Do you think Israel's a terrorist of organization? Not. Well, Can you answer my question? Do yeah, you think Hamas is a terrorist organization? I already did. I already did. Do you Let think, me explain something to you. Do you think you. that the acts committed on October 7th were legitimate? You think that gang rape, that mass rape, sexual violence is a method of war? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Do you think October 6th, 5th, 4th, 8th, 9th, 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 
um, including now she supported the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, she supported the Chinese Communist Party when they took over Hong Kong. Let's have said that, show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> said that it was a result of Western aggression, and that's why China's just responding in Hong Kong. I mean, madness. So we're talking about a, an oppressive regime which aggressively and violently shut down protesters, censored all of the press, took over all of the media in Hong Kong, uh, removed all free speech. And, it's, it's, and killed a million Muslim eagles. Of course, of course. There's no comments about the, you know, the the murder of Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims. Uh, she also, of course, opposes uh, the democratic state of Taiwan, thinks it should be uh, the Chinese Communist Party. She supported dictatorship in Venezuela. She also believes that NATO is a conspiracy of the West in order to control other populations. And of course, my favorite is that everything that Iran has done um, from, you know, murdering women or, or any of the other human rights abuses that they're doing are simply a reaction to the West. All of this is somehow the West's fault. It's America's fault. And keep in mind, she's an American citizen, lives in Oregon or something somewhere on the West Coast and, um, you know, spouts all this nonsense from her comfortable uh, American home. Of course, if she lived in any of these countries that she defends under any of these dictatorships, she would not have that privilege, of course. But, you know, the West is evil and Israel is, of course, the, the little Satan. I mean, she actually fit in quite well in Iran. I think she <laughs> would. Yeah. She would be the ambassador for them somewhere. I will sponsor a trip to Iran for Abby Martin if I, she wants. Yeah. Iran or Gaza. Gaza. Your choice, Abby. I think Gaza <laughs> would be better. But anyway, at least you got a chance to slap down your scumbag of the week, which Very is true. a privilege that any of us get <laughs> any day of the week. Vivian, who's your scumbag this week? So my scumbag this week is Bassam Youssef, who is oh. an uh, yeah, what else? He's okay. another <laughs> Cheers Morgan guest. He is what else? He is, yeah. he is a, thank God he's got you now and again. <laughs> I mean, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Uh, he's uh, he's a very handsome Egyptian American comedian and uh, currently doing, I think, some big hot comedy tour in yeah. Europe, which is all kind of totally weird for me <laughs> at this moment. Um, and he's a surgeon. He's a really accomplished, smart guy. He also has um, some problems with respect to his kind of, you know, understanding of history and also what's going on at the moment. And again, I just have to, uh, I didn't compile as as fabulous a list as as Emily did. But, uh, you know, I've got, I mean, this is just an example of what this person does. Um, you know, speaking on a UK uh, radio show, Israel's corrupted the West morally for 100 years. You cannot come with a straight face lecturing us about morality or human rights anymore. Um, he's been no, he's made comments to the effect that what Israel is doing in Gaza now is like the most horrific humanitarian crime that's ever in the been. last yeah. hundred years. Yeah, yeah that's ever it's been. just crazy yeah. rhetoric. Yeah. And, um, you know, people like him, it reminds me of the, the clip that went viral from Dr. Phil. Mm, yeah. Right this week, yeah. yes. Doctor oh, Phil yes. had on. I don't know who Doctor Phil is. Oh yes, <laughs> but Doctor Phil had on uh, Mossab. Yeah, Mossab Hassan. Mossab yeah. Hassan Youssef, yeah. the son of Hamas. Google him if you don't know who he is. Amazing. His guy. father was one of the Hamas founders, and he's you know really gone rogue on Hamas and lives quietly undercover. It's an incredible story. Um, and he knows what the ideology is and he knows what the mentality is. And he was on Dr. Phil with these two um, Arab American women who I think were from, both from Dearborn. And, um, you know, they objected so passionately to this idea that they even have to acknowledge anything wrong with Hamas's ideology or what, what was question. done on October 7th. Yes. It was so offensive to them. There are some things that are just fundamental human decency. And when I ask you if what happened on October 7th is something you condemn, and you say, well, you have to look at that by looking at hundreds of years of conflict. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's either right or it's wrong. The vast majority of the Palestinian people support Hamas. Really? This is a fact. This is proven by statistics and your silence now. You are not even, you cannot even condemn Hamas and say that what they did on October 7 was an act of a savage group. You don't have that power. Bassem's kind of like with the chicks in, in Dearborn. 
And it's sad. Ashira, who's your scumbag of the week? My scumbag of the week is this woman on the University of Oregon's campus. I don't know her Ooh. name, but I just seen this clip. And students there, they hosted a hostage demonstration where they had like stakes in the grass of all the hostages. She's there taking all the stakes out of the grass saying, F the hostages, F these hostages, F Zionists, Zionists, da da Oh, we have a kid of it. Student? I don't know if she's a student, but she's on campus. And she, I'm not sure because she looks a bit older, but that doesn't mean anything. She could still be a student. Maybe it's Abby Martin. <laughs> out there in Oregon. <laughs> oh, out there in Oregon, yeah. right. Oh, that's, yeah. true. that's where she resides. You would think that I would stop being shocked at this point, but I'm still shocked every time I see this. I'm like, these are hostages. Like, there's no morality. Like, no, no. Why can't you just say yeah. politically you stand against Israel, but on a moral level, on hum- humanitarian level, humanity level, like, this is not right that there's hostages there. Well, way beyond that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, why, that. sure, why haven't you stopped being shocked? Like, it, it, this is normal for this. <sighs> well, my scumbag um, is somebody that I've spent the last six months. Um, he's my Trudeau. Oh, wow. His Pedro Sanchez. That's serious. Pedro, San- <laughs> Pedro Sanchez is the president of Spain. Okay. I tell you why he's my Trudeau. Because I actually speak Spanish and I do a lot of public diplomacy in Spanish in the Spanish press. And I've been attacking him relentlessly for the last six months. So he's my Trudeau, because you attack Trudeau in English. I I attack this dude in Spanish. And so I've become famous in Spain for attacking Pedro Sanchez the way that you attack Trudeau. We need another bell. We need another bell for Pedro Sanchez. So many bells. We need a clip of you attacking him. Oh, yes, we must. Yes, we'll we'll put subtitles on it. Great idea. Pero, pero él está hablando como si no hemos intentado ya cinco veces. Intentamos los años 30. Intentamos en el 47 con la ONU. Intentamos en los años 90. Intentamos en el 2001. Y e intentamos en el 2006. Porque él nos está hablando como si nosotros llevamos aquí 75 años sin intentar hacer la paz. Como si nos está diciendo algo que no sabemos. Eh, y es verdad que en estas cinco intentonas eh, previas siempre esa posibilidad ha saltado por los aires por culpa de los propios dirigentes palestinos, eh, que en el último momento Entonces, se echaron no atrás. Eso, eso también le dio la él razón. Él no sabe historia, él no sabe historia, él no ha abierto un libro. Entonces a, él, a nosotros nos está dando lecciones en lo que tenemos que hacer. Uy, mira qué, qué inteligente este hombre diciendo lo que necesitamos la paz y que necesitamos la autodeterminación de los palestinos. No lo sabíamos, nos dijo algo que no sabíamos. Anda. <laughs> anyway, so um, so Pedro Sanchez has been on the wrong side of history since the beginning of this conflict. The, to add insult to injury, he came two weeks after October 7th. He stood in the border in Kfar Aza after seeing, bearing witness to the atrocities. And he goes and talks about Israel indiscriminately bombing Gaza when we'd just <laughs> gone in. It wasn't even like deep into the conflict. It wasn't last week. It was right in the first month. And so he's been despicable. He's got a terrible government. He's allied himself with, they've got a similar political system in Spain than than we do here in the sense that they have to create a coalition. And like here, they spend years having election after election. It's a very similar political system. And now in order to get into uh, power, he's allied himself with the most extreme left wingers who are basically dictating the agenda somehow. Anyway, the latest thing he's done is that he said, he's announced that he's announcing Palestinian statehood come what may in June. Okay. Go right. Basques. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He's got his own cessationist. Go Catalonia. Catalonia, Catalonia. Yeah. He's got his own yeah. cessationist parties. He's got his own issues with people wanting their own regional independence. But he, Pedro Sanchez, who actually wants to position himself a little bit like Trudeau, as the big statesman in Europe, he's come out with this and, of course, absolutely ridiculous. He's pushing the European Union to do the same, so he's a very bad influence. When he's got his own people in his own country that he has kind of shut up about their own secessionist hopes. And so hypocritical, hypocrisy, moral bankruptcy. Yeah. But I have to say, the only thing that encourages me a little bit is that he is hated in Spain by half of his country. Oh, that's great. Because of the coalition system. 
And I get so many messages from decent Spanish people saying, he's a clown. We hate him the way you get about Trudeau. The same <laughs> Me, thing. old country. The whole Maybe I get about Spanish, Trudeau. Maybe the Spanish <laughs> guy should kind of hook up with Lula in Brazil. Yes, and talk about the 12 million dead in Gaza. Yes. So uh, we can join Boston, who also isn't good at math. Oh, my right. God. We should send him all on and a I cruise just, to hell. So yes. we're, you, there's never been such an interrupted scumbag. But, no, I love um, it. <laughs> Justin, that's Justin Trudeau. <laughs> uh, he didn't even come. The only G7 leaders who didn't even come to <laughs> Israel following October 7th are... Justin and the Prime Minister of Japan. Wow. Well, all I can tell you is that this dude came and apparently it didn't help at all. Okay. So Pedro Sanchez, my scumbag of the week. All right. Phew. And to finish, on a positive note, because we always, we ladies always find the positive. We always find the heroes of the week. Ashira, let's start with you. Who's your hero? My hero of the week is an organization called Planet Therapy. It's mm -hmm. ran by two Israeli women who live in Spain. Uh, their names are Ilana O'Malley and Tal Nir. So they launched this after October 7th. They're two therapists. Um, they offer therapy to everyone in Israel f for free. They have um, therapists that speak in 21 different languages. Wow. And they have serviced 400 plus people so far. They, they reached out to me to tell me they have more capacity to service more people. Wow. And I just want to get their name out there because they want to continue to give this service to the Israeli citizens for free. Ashira, I love wow. the way that you platform such great organizations and people. Thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Vivian, did you find a hero? I may never stop if I start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a hero. I have like... The it's, hero. And it's not Justin. So, um, you know, I know nobody really knows what Canada is or where, but it, it, it's a real country and um, there are America hat. Yeah, it's on top of America. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, Justin Trudeau is our prime minister and has been for eight plus years. And he really is a disaster. It's not just me. We're going to have elections sometime in the next year and a half. And the expectation based on polls for the last year and now is that my hero, Pierre Polyev, is going to be the next prime minister. It's not one of those situations where eh, 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 it is, a, he's on track for a resounding majority. So it's not just me who loathes Justin Trudeau. The country is a mess. Yeah. But yeah. here's why he's my hero. Pierre Polyev is my hero today. On Sunday, that marked the six months since October 7th. Yeah. And no one in the government did anything to commemorate, to sanctify, to recognize that horrible day. Um, and Pierre Polyev went to Toronto to a rally and he was surrounded by hateful um, pro-Hamas demonstrators and a much smaller group of pro-Israel demonstrators. And he gave the most fiery, principled, clear, brilliant six-minute oration in support of Israel how moral it is, how we as Canadians with Canadian values and decency and a freedom-loving country have to support Israel. And I get shivers every time. Aww. You can find any clip you want to show of this brilliant speech. It is an honor to stand with you here today. Friends of humanity, Jews, Gentiles, people of all backgrounds, Canadians, all people of decency, to stand against the homicidal, genocidal death cult that is Hamas, a death cult that must be destroyed so that we can free the hostages and restore peace for all. You know, we're more than bacon and maple syrup in Canada. Um, and when we have proper leadership, like we did under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and we will again soon under uh, Pierre Polyev, we actually can have serious behind the scenes influence Absolutely. as a really principled middle power. So go Canada. Go Canada, go Pierre. Go Pierre. <laughs> Emily. Uh, so my hero is a little bit bittersweet go this on. week. Um, I, I'm sure you guys saw uh, what happened with the family of hostage Liri Albang, the family. Yes. So yeah. this week her family received um, oh, a so wreath, so cool. uh, like a flowers, a wreath, uh, with a message of, uh, well, normally it's condolences, but this week they received a, a note that said, the country matters more than your daughter, um, which is obviously an awful, awful, awful thing. 
um, to receive. When when they spoke to the police and they investigated a little bit, it turns out that it looks like uh, it possibly was uh, the Iranian regime behind this that was uh, that had orchestrated this delivery as sort of psychological warfare. Um, but you know, I just have to to make them the my hero of the week, the whole family, because it's just been. I mean, unimaginable suffering for six months and counting. They don't know where she is. They don't know if she's alive. They don't know what's happening to her. If God forbid she's being abused, as we have seen hostages who have been released say that almost all of them are, if not all, on a regular basis. And so I want to make them my heroes of the week just for persevering oh, uh, and just for, for continuing to fight. I know that they're out there. They're speaking to the media. They're speaking to world leaders. They're speaking to everyone they can, anyone who will listen uh, about why we need to be putting the release of hostages at the forefront of the agenda. And I just can't even imagine doing so in a situation like that with you know my, my loved ones. It's uh, unimaginable. So I'm sending uh, all the all the family of Liri Albag strength, and, and and I'm hoping and praying, uh, and we'll continue advocating for the release of uh, all the hostages. But this week especially, uh, Liri. Amen. What a horrible thing to happen to the family. Yeah. Like if they're not under intense enough trauma and pressure. So my hero this week is a guy called Coleman Hughes, who is a fellow of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He's got his own podcast. And he went on Joe Rogan, who is a huge podcaster, who a few weeks ago uh, in conversation started saying, yes, Israel is definitely committing genocide. Now, why do we care about people like that? Because this Joe Rogan has so many listeners, so many followers, amongst them my two sons. Like, it bothers me. Then Coleman Hughes, quiet, understated guy, comes on his show, not only does he unpack the fictitious numbers of Hamas saying, okay, let's say they're correct in his 32,000 people who are dead. What, they're all innocent people? Where are the combatants? Let's say half are combatants or 13, 14,000 are combatants. You're not talking about 32 anymore. And slowly, slowly, so calmly, he basically started dismantling the whole argument for genocide. And not only that, he turned it on his head and said, okay, what are we saying to the world when we're telling Israel to stop the war? We're saying to them, terrorists can come to your house, they can kidnap your people, they can kill as many people, they can rape as many women, and then they can hide behind innocent civilians, their own people, and that's okay. Yep. That's what you're saying to the world. And he completely dismantled Joe Rogan. He completely disarmed him. Did you think and that Rogan? Yeah, he, he was like, he was like, you well, know. it looks like you know more than I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. think? <laughs> you think? I'm saying that when you're killing 30,000 innocent civilians in response to something that killed 1,200 innocent civilians and you're continuing to bomb an area into oblivion, mm. which is what it looks like mm. when you're looking at Gaza, there's many people that have made the argument that that is at least the steps of genocide or a form of genocide. It's not 30,000 civilians that have been killed, though. How many th thousands have been killed? So according to ha uh, Gaza Health Ministry, which mm -hmm. is it is run by Hamas, the number they have is 32,000. But they don't distinguish between Hamas and civilians. This is a challenge no army has faced. And so that that's what makes this war different. And and yes, the the I agree with all of the the absolute tragedy and suffering of the Palestinian people, but it's what what creates that is the way Hamas fights. And either we can say one of two things. We can either say, well, Israel just Israel doesn't have a clean shot, and so they have to let Hamas get away with it because it's too much to bear. Um, but then we are essentially creating a situation where terrorists have found the perfect solution, which is that you can cross the border, go house to house slaughtering your enemies, and then hide behind your own people and they can do nothing about it. I appreciate your perspective. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you clearly know more about it than I do. So before making these bombastic statesmen, statements, people who have influence, who have followers, know what you're talking about. Don't throw blood libels out there because it doesn't just affect us here in Israel. It affects Jews around the world. It puts them in danger. Humanity. And it affects humanity. And it's basically given permission to these barbarians to do what they did. 
So thank you very much, Coleman Hughes, for just putting things, making things clear. Okay, ladies, another week and another week we're together. Thank God next week, <laughs> Emily and I uh, will be traveling and you ladies will hold a fort with some great guests. And we pray as we do every week that by next week and hopefully before the Freedom Festival of Pesach, we will have, we will, these horrible people will let our people go and we will have our hostages back home. Thank you.